Hey, hey, everyone. This is Carlos, CEO at Product School and your host on the Product Podcast. Today, I'm excited to welcome Jamie Dilang, the VP of Product and General Manager at Slack. Slack is a game changer in team communication, transforming how we collaborate with colleagues and organizations. Hope you don't remember those days before Slack where we all had to use email big time and uh, send endless threats to people, forward those threats to others, copy others, and so on. Uh, Slack, Slack has revolutionized all of that. Uh, it was acquired by Salesforce for nearly $28 billion in December of 2020. And it continues to thrive with over 200,000 paid customers in more than 150 countries, including 80% of Fortune 100 companies. At peak time, Slack delivers 300,000 messages per second. And on average, 4.7 billion messages are sent in Slack each week. Jamie has been with Slack for seven years, uh, leading various product roles, and is now the VP of product for Self-Serve. Before Slack, she spent seven years at Etsy, rising from customer support to director of product. Welcome to the product podcast, Jamie. Thanks, Carlos. I'm excited to be here. Jamie, what's your most common emoji on Slack? Oh, I've done this a few times. Uh, I think almost always it ends up being something that promotes other people's work. So uh, there's one we have that's just like a hand like this. It's like, like I just say like, yes, this. Uh, or pluses, lots of pluses. Um, I tend to be a big cheerleader for other folks. You know, we added some custom emojis and in our internal Slack with people's faces. And that's oh, such yeah. a good way to, to celebrate them. Absolutely. I love this. But one of the things that I noticed, and I'm, I'm an emoji user too, is that some of people in the younger generation, they just don't think it's cool. And they're trying to express themselves with stickers, voice notes, or other forms of communication. So yeah. curious to see if you have noticed seen any of those trends. Yeah, I mean, I think like there's definitely the normal emoji, like the, the set that kind of ships with your phone. Uh, people don't think that's cool. Like it's very, uh, it's very millennial to give a thumbs up. But uh, well, I think like the ability to create custom emoji inside of Slack helps people feel like it can still be relevant. We, we still see tons and tons of emoji coming up, um, not just for fun, but also like for real business use cases, which is cool. Uh, it, it ends up being a really powerful tool, tool for communication. So it actually helped me be more thankful in general. I remember when I was exchanging emails with people like, I would be, I would feel bad if I had to send an email copying everybody to say, thank you, or you're welcome. And now just making it so easy to correspond without, you know, bothering other people, I think it's just making us more, more polite. Yeah. I think that's the same thing too. When you're also like, you can be like, yes, like this is a great yes. idea. Like I want to plus this. Like it is like, I remember, you know, early in my career, we'd have everyone at email chains and everyone would just reply being like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, your whole inbox would just be like people being yeah, and you'd be like, oh god, I have to kill this. Um, but with emoji, it just kind of like all piles up, and everybody can see it and feel good about it. Um, so, I noticed another interesting transition in in your career. You spent around seven years in Etsy, and then you moved into into Slack. And Etsy is an e-commerce marketplace, I would say, right? Well, Slack yeah, seems yeah. more like a B two B SaaS communications platform. So, how were you able to transition some of that product management expertise to a very different type of product? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, my initial role at Slack was in search and machine learning, and most of the product work that I did at Etsy was also in search and machine learning. So, for me, I was like, okay, I got this. I got search and machine learning. I'm going to take that and I'm going to do it in a totally different domain. Um, because I didn't want to keep working on e-commerce. I was like, I could go to another marketplace or a D2C. I know how to sell stuff, but I don't really want to do that right now. I wanted to learn a bunch more. So uh, that was really the, the link for me was like, I know how to build search products. I know how to build machine learning products and everything else is totally brand new. Uh, it ended up actually being much more challenging than I anticipated because the data environment inside of a B2B company is so different than the data environment inside of a B2C company. Um, the fundamental difference is, you know, when you're shopping on Etsy or Amazon or, you know, browsing on Google, Google and Amazon and Etsy, they, they 
are own your data, basically. Like that's kind of the agreement. Uh, but at Slack, the customer owns the data. So we couldn't look at things like what are the top queries very easily. Whereas at Etsy, I could just pull that down. Um, if people were having trouble finding stuff in search at Etsy, I could open up a tool and like see exactly what people are doing step by step. What did they search for and what results came back? Um, and use that to debug. At Slack, I didn't have any of that. So uh, it was much it was much more challenging than I anticipated it being. Uh, but you also have the opportunity to have a much richer relationship with your customers because somebody is paying you. Uh, and when they're paying you a subscription, they have they have a vested interest in what you're building. So um, I found that to be super rewarding, being able to like, actually chat with a customer, sometimes even in a Slack channel, uh, to better understand what they needed. And I all have also found that, you know, in a two-sided marketplace, a lot of the conversations we would have would be like, are the sellers our customers? Are the buyers our customers? You know, who are we actually doing this for? And I think at the end of the day, we resolved that, you know, we're trying to get sellers more sales. That's mostly what we're trying to do. Uh, but sometimes it could feel like you were adversarial with your users. Sometimes you make a change and a seller didn't really like it. Uh, for instance, at Slack, I've felt m the vast majority of the time um, that our, our interests are always aligned with our users. Our users might have very different opinions and then you have a whole other problem, which is, uh, you know, some people really like something, some people really hate something. That happens all the time. But we're, we're always trying to move in the same direction as our users. And uh, something about that has been, it's just been very good for me, I think, as a product manager. Um, and I mean, in a way, like Slack was a great replacement or improvement from email. At least that's how I mm -hmm. started using it. I was like, oh my God, like internally, we don't email. Sometimes people would email me, I take a screenshot and share it on Slack okay. just to make a point that we message each other on Slack. With Slack now, particularly, I also have a ton of unread messages. So how do you, as a product leader, ensure that you can solve the problem, but also stay innovative and, and cool so people actually enjoy using your product? Yeah. So... Uh, we, you know, we try to stay cool with things like huddles, backgrounds, uh, I'm joking, but actually I, I really love the huddles backgrounds. I think one of the things before I get to the noise question, one of the things that is very baked into Slack's DNA is that using the software should be fun. And like it, it actually shows up in a lot of product requirement docs. I put it in most of my product requirement docs because we want it to actually be delightful. Like that's, that's. That's actually like critical to the functionality of the product. If it's not delightful, it's not doing its job. So um, I think that just like being baked into the culture is really helpful. On on noise specifically, uh, it's funny that, you know, for, for some people, I think this is a new problem. For Slack, inside of Slack, this is a very old problem. Um, when I was first interviewing uh, back in 2017, well, my whole interview around search and machine learning was really like, how do you help people quiet the noise, find the right information. Um, I spent a lot of time in those first couple of years trying to build products that could help. Uh, I was very obsessed with this idea of information fit and how do we like point the right people to the right data at the right time so they can get their job done more effectively. I think that's a, this is like one of those things that you have to never lose sight of. You have to continually keep it in sort of your crosshairs because the problem is never going to get go away. The more people use Slack, the more uh, work is happening, the bigger companies get, like noise is always going to be an issue. Um, and it's not something that you just solve in one fell swoop and say like, oh, we're done with that. It's an always on problem. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, I think we we think a lot about, sim there's simple solutions, right? Things like, what are what's the default notification for a channel? How do we help people understand that like, Maybe you don't have to read every single Slack message. What is our product telling you uh, about how you should interact with it? Is it giving you anxiety and making you feel like, oh my God, I have 76 unreads. I'm like way behind. Or are we saying like, you know, 76 messages were written while you were gone, but you need to read these three. Um, so I think, I think there's like simple things we can do around notifications. We've done a lot of that um, activity. 
I think does, has done a lot to sort of elevate the the things that you actually need to look at that like your at mentions, replies in thread, um, DMs being sort of separate also kind of gives you like a place to kind of be quiet and not look at all the channels. Um, but there's so much more that we can do. Um, it's a, obviously it's a thing that we're really focused on right now. Um, and AI has a big role to play here too. So uh, a lot of our AI product products um, are actually also focused on this. Like, how do I help people pay attention to the right stuff? Um, we launched recaps earlier this year, which takes sort of the ability for you to say like all of these channels, I don't actually care about reading them that frequently, but I do kind of want to know what's going on. So I want them to roll up into a, a digest and I can read that once a, once a day. I could read it once a week. Um, but that sort of idea of like giving you a way to say like this stuff, not that important to me. Um, I think we, we need to keep pursuing that. We also need to do a better job of helping you find the stuff that is important to you. Um, because if everything is noisy, then how are you going to find anything? Right. So I think that as we look at like what's next for us in noise reduction, that like highlighting what's most important, um, it's something we have better tools to do than we did seven years ago when I was first trying to look at this with uh, machine learning and using the normal sort of stuff you look at, like who's clicking on a message, who's like engaging with the message, like that stuff doesn't work inside of Slack. You have to have a whole different way of thinking about it. Yeah, and I'm going to geek out uh, with you on this because I'm a power user and also very opinionated. So <laughs> with, e with email, um, so I, I was able to give access to my assistant and I'm pr yeah. privileged for having opportunity of having another person help me prioritize certain things with Slack. I didn't have that option. Right. So I still have to do it myself. And at some point, like having a summary would be very helpful and, and I'm already using AI. So it's already there. It's still only helping me with the AI converse so with the Slack conversation. So I, I hear you on like the opportunity of feeding other conversations and information around the entire ecosystem. Um, but I drive and like, sometimes I actually ask, um, uh, we see uh, Apple CarPlay, Hey, read me my emails. And that was actually good. I was able to respond and text as well. So eventually I hope I can do the same with, with Slack because my life I'll is on Slack. The, I'll take the feature request back. Uh, I, 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 we'll tell the team for sure. I'll see if I can get uh, your CarPlay <laughs> integration on the roadmap. <laughs> But let's talk about AI. I think that's also like the big opportunity. I, I noticed that you're actually monetizing AI. Like most of the SaaS platforms I've seen out there, Superhuman, or Notion, Coda, they, they all have their own AI superpowers as part of their sometimes free or, or paid plan, but there is not like an add-on. And I noticed that in Slack, you charge for that separately. So I'd love to learn more about your rationale behind that. Yeah, so um, I think... There's, there's really two parts to, to the rationale for charging. Um, one is the value that we think we're giving uh, the customer. So um, I think this is like the, the most important one, um, which is we have a lot, a lot of data inside of Slack. If you're a company that's been using Slack for years, there's, there's just a mountain of, of information uh, inside of Slack. Much more, I would venture, than what's in your Notion and what's in uh, your uh, Asana or, you know, your Miro. You know, th this is like actually kind of a database for your company, um, even though it might not feel that way. And so the, the part of what we're doing with our AI product is giving you access to all of that data that we're already storing. And I think when you think about AI products, or machine learning products historically, a lot of where the cost has come from is in the data processing uh, and the data management and the value you're getting from that data, right? So I remember looking at SaaS uh, products uh, for AI, everyone charged you by data or by query. Uh, and so I think, you know, value per interaction that you're getting from Slack, I think it's, it's, it's higher uh, honestly, than it is for a lot of those other tools. The other thing is, you know, th this is this is also a thing that it costs money. Uh, it like just does cost money. Um, so 
when we were thinking about how do we make the best possible product for for customers um, and incentivize ourselves to continue to innovate in the space, continue to deliver like what we think is really like head and shoulders value above um, some of those those other tools based on the quality of the data that you have we have access to. Um, we wanted to make sure that all of our incentives are sort of swimming in the the right same direction. Um, and I think also one thing I would say is you kind of just alluded to this as we were talking about recaps, but I think like there's, I think that there's an opportunity for Slack AI to not just help you get more out of your conversations in Slack, help you save time. It does do that, but to also help you just get information, insight that you wouldn't otherwise have. And we know that people spend an inordinate amount of their time at work searching and they spend way too much time switching between applications. So there's, I think, as we think about how do we continue to innovate in the AI and deliver value uh, against, you know, the product that we're charging for, because we're not done, you know, we're going to keep putting a bunch of stuff in there. Um, we're really thinking about how do we help you get more out of your data, again, in the place where the eyeballs already are. Like, Slack is a perfectly natural place to have something like an assistant experience, right? Like it's, you wake up, you check your Slack. That's what you do. Like, what are you going to do that day? What, what, what meetings do you have? Uh, what's the most important thing for you to pay attention to? I think there are opportunities for Slack AI to help with all of those things in a way that like, I don't, I don't, I mean, maybe someone at Notion would tell you differently, but I don't really see Notion AI having the same you know, set of data to work from and also like place in a user's life that Slack has. So um, I think to me, it's like, what value are we creating now? What value are we going to add in the future? And we we really think it's it's enough to say, hey, maybe we should charge a little bit more. Um, I, I also think like Slack is pretty, generally speaking, it's pretty affordable. And we tend to try to put all of the features into existing plans. We don't raise prices very frequently. Um, so we didn't want to raise the base price for everyone out of the gate, particularly because it's not a totally proven feature yet. You know, we wanted to see where we could get on product market fit. And then you know, we can always we can always reevaluate. But raising the price for everybody, just be able to get uh, some innovation moving on the feature didn't also feel like the right thing to do. Another question about pricing, as, as we see more and more teams, uh, not just product teams, but teams in general, being reduced because now they can be more efficient due to AI. And a lot of the B2B SaaS companies, they base their pricing on seats. And now yeah. I see more of a transition to usage, especially if that company has less seats. How are you thinking about pricing your product? So in self-serve, in the self-serve business, we price both based on seats and on usage. So we're kind of already, we're already there. Uh, we, have, we have a fair billing practice where if you don't use the product, uh, in a month, you don't get charged for that seat. So it's a little bit of of both things happening at the same time. Um, I think going back to the like beginning of Slack, um, you know, early like conversations with Stuart back in the day, there's always been a focus on delivering more value than we charge people for. And so I think that that's where we we tend to kind of try to live is like. In that place, that's where the fair billing come, practice comes in on, on the self-serve business. Um, there are other places where we've played around uh, with usage-based pricing. So um, on our workflow builder, we have a concept of usage-based pricing. Um, I think it's it's always something that kind of, it's come into the conversations, um, but there's also a desire to maintain simplicity and predictability. And so I think deciding where you do seats and where you do metered usage, it depends on what is what is actually the thing that you're the value that you're delivering to the user. So something like, you know, uh database usage, queries per second, like that kind of thing, like it probably makes more sense to charge based on usage than the number of seats who have access to it. Um, but for something like Slack, which is like a really broadly based tool, like I don't want to charge you based on like something like the number of messages you send. That would be insane. Um, and we probably don't want to charge you based on data storage either. 
uh, because we want to incentivize you to really get more out of the archive and we want more of that data to be available for you and your AI model later. So, um, I, I, yeah, I think, I think you always have to think about what kinds of incentives you're setting up for yourself and for the business. Um, we don't want people paying for a bunch of seats that they're not using. And we also don't want people to use the product less because, uh, they're worried about having to pay for it. So yeah. we try to think about both of those things together. And, and, and that's why I, I like product teams owning the number as well as the pricing and go-to-market decisions, because ultimately you want to balance those, those different dimensions. And we saw that with PLG, like there are companies that do free trials, others that would do freemium. You do both. And sometimes the answer is actually both. And having someone who understands both sides of the equation makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah and, and I think, you know, we use different things for, uh, like we, we've found in the past six months since I've kind of stepped into this role on the PLG team that like, you can use different things for different things. Like you can use the freemium uh, product for something completely different than the trials is actually used for. Um, and that, that could be beneficial to your business overall. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun actually being able to play with these different levers when you're responsible for the number. And Jamie, how do you structure your, your team to ensure that you have enough uh, resources allocated to AI and the future, enough resources allocated to core features and, and other things that, that you have? Yeah, so uh, luckily I am not responsible for resourcing across the entire product or get Slack. Uh, that is a nightmare. <laughs> I, 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 I empathize with uh, regularly because there's always so much really great stuff to do. Um, but inside of my organization, uh, we kind of, I, I kind of have broken it into three parts of the funnel. So there's awareness and consideration, there's paying, and then there's growing. And when we think about, you know, how are we allocated across, uh, these different, uh, pillars of the product led growth motion, uh, I think about, you know, what do we have stacked in for the quarter? It's really, it really kind of just looks like you're looking at a PNL. It's like, what are the experiments that we have in play or the big bets that we have in terms of the business that we have in play? Do we have those all staffed correctly? If we hit those things, are we projected to hit our number? If not, like, let's figure out how to shuffle things around. Um, also, we look at organic trends. So let's say, you know, it, people are expanding at a much higher rate than we expected them to. Maybe then we shift a little bit more into new, or maybe we say the opposite thing and say, wow, that's a trend. We want to see if we can juice it. So I, I try to have, we have these pillars and then we try to have flexibility on the projects quarter to quarter. Um, and I treat that like growth and, uh, new, new uh, business and then expansion business. I treat the, that set of people as kind of like, that's my core staff. We all operate with, you know, that's the first team mentality. And if, you know, one of the areas is doing really well or needs more resourcing, we have the conversations there. There's always the expectation that everyone will be doing what's right for the whole business, not what's right just for their organization. Um, and so far, it's been great. We haven't, I haven't had any like major issues, uh, except to say that we always, everyone always needs more people. So we say always all the time <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and more, and more money. Uh, exactly. More people, more money, more time. Everyone <laughs> always. <laughs> uh, so how, how big is your overall team? Um, everyone together sort of all baked in is like between one and 200 people, including like engineering product design, uh, et cetera, my org. So I manage a set of, I gotta, I'm like, let me count, uh, nine, I think there's nine PMs. Uh, and then I also have the localization and uh, translation team as well as the help and learning team. So there's like a little ops org inside of my org as well. Well, Jamie, love chatting with you, learning more about how you're thinking about product. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's been great.